So I'm going to talk, I don't know who this message is for this morning, but I know the Lord's laid it on my heart. I've been working on this for a couple, two, three weeks now, and, and I knew today was the day I needed to deliver it. So if it's not for everybody, it's going to be for somebody, okay? But uh, we, how many of y'all knows that it's not a matter of, uh, uh, of if you will ever go through a, a, an issue or a circumstance in life. It's a matter of when, okay? Bec- why is that? Why is it a when? Because we live in a fallen world. We live in a world that's broken. We live in a world that needs Jesus Christ more now than ever. It's darker. It's more corrupt. It's more ugly than it's ever been. And so we need Jesus today more than we needed him yesterday. Amen? So God is speaking uh, to us about walking through darkness. And when I first read this text, uh, you know, I, 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 I want you to understand that he's not talking about there's like three, there, there's th- I'm going to label three categories of darkness, okay? The first category is the darkness of sin. John 3, uh, 19 through 20 says, And the judgment is based on this fact. God's life, light came into the world, but people loved darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for the fear their sins will be exposed. Light is a great, uh, uh, if you will, it sanitizes. It brings and exposes things for what it is. So the number one uh, kind of darkness is sin. Sin, doing wrong, displeasing to God. The second type of darkness that that we can find throughout uh, the world and through the Bible is called the darkness of ignorance. Now, ignorance is not a bad word. Somebody says, oh, they're ignorant. Uh, You know, it sounds kind of harsh, but ignorance, if you call somebody, say, oh, they're stupid or they're dumb, now that's bad. But if you say somebody's ignorant, it means that you just don't know. You've not uh, been uh, privy to that information or you've not been taught that. So uh, there's a darkness of ignorance, not knowing, not knowing the goodness of God. Not knowing the plan of God for your life. Not knowing what walking in, in, in spiritual truth and spiritual freedom is all about. So there's a lot of darkness in the world today because of ignorance. Because a lot of people don't know. They just don't know. And the third type of darkness is they're, they're living under a demonic darkness. Now we don't like to really talk a whole lot about this because it sometimes freaks people out. But demons are real in the world today. There are demons that are loose on this earth today, tormenting and causing havoc in people's lives and taking them over. And so uh, we, uh, we, we combat that through power, through prayer, and through the Word. But those are the three major uh, types of darkness that I think of when I think of darkness. But God's not talking about this in this passage. He's talking about people like you and I. The ones that believe in Christ and have given our lives to Christ and, and, and walking out uh, the word in our lives every day and doing the very best we can. So he says, he says I'm talking about good people, saved people, honorable people that go through tough times, dark times, and they feel like God is nowhere around. Now I'll be honest with you, I'm a very transparent pastor and speaker. There's been times in my life that I know that I haven't done anything wrong. I, I know that I'm trying to do the very best I can, pleasing to the Lord. But sometimes God feels a million miles away from me. He, you know, when I pray, I, I, I often say, God, are you even hearing me? Do you know that I still exist on planet Earth? Do you, do you still know where I'm at? Do you know where my address? So, so uh, I, there's times that we feel like that. But when those times come into our lives, could it, could it be? Could it be God allowing that, that distant time or that dry time to come into our lives to draw us closer to Him? Because we all are, uh, have the innate uh, uh, nature, if you will, to uh, when things are good and things are flowing and, and I'm walking in the blessings of the Lord and I'm walking in the favor of the Lord and everything seems to be a windfall my way. If I'm not careful, I will begin to drift a little bit and put God on the back burner of my life, if you will, thinking that I can control this, I can do it, and I'm just going to bask in what I've got going on right now. But sometimes God, He loves us so much 
He loves us so much, He never wants to leave us where we are. I, I said in the first service that God knows the end from the beginning. He never operates from the beginning to the end. He operates from the end back to the beginning. That's why He can come and tell you, follow me, follow me, walk with me. But, but, but Lord, I, I don't see how it's going to work out. I, 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 you know, I don't see how it's laid out. I don't see the steps. I don't see the method. I don't, I don't see the, uh, the, the, the finances or whatever. He said, hey, I already been out here. I know what it turns out to be. Don't worry about that. Faith, faith, come, come, follow me. Take a step, take a step. Faith acts like it's so, even though it's not so, so it can become so faith if if God laid out every jot and tittle of our life and gave us a manual and said here's step one Jim you do this you do this and this is going to happen and this door is going to open and boom 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 oh man I'll go in that that's a piece of cake now that you're at step one Jim step two here here's the plan for step two you're going to go over here this person's going to be introduced into your life yada 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 you're going to go here this is going to happen oh okay that's a piece of cake I'll go do that that's, the, not, that's not the way life goes. Faith is taking a step in the right direction that you know God wants you to go, even not seeing what's out there. I used this illustration in the first service, and I've used it uh, 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 in the past, but I, I, I believe it bears repeating again. Uh, you have headlights on your car, and those headlights project out so far. And you feel very confident moving from where you are to the point of where those headlights end projecting. So you can make that forward progress in your life. But if you never move from that place of where you're at, you'll never see beyond or go what's beyond the, the distance of what the headlights are shining. So we have to move forward in life and keep forward. And as we go, life gets illuminated. Our steps get illuminated. Things become brighter and we see. So as we go as a step of faith, then we're able to navigate and make the journey that God has for us in our lives. Satan said to God, oh, let me back up. Life is a journey, and the journey to heaven is sometimes made at night. Well, pastor, that's not very positive. Tell me something positive. Make me feel good today. I'm making you feel good. I'm giving you something to stand upon when the tough times come in life that you'll be able to go reflect back to and say, hey, I know I got this. I know my Jesus has got this. But sometimes the journey in life is made at night. That's why we learn to trust on God. Like I said, if everything was laid out, it would be a piece of cake. And we would feel self-sufficient in our own right. But God loves us so much, He says, I want you to depend upon me. I want you to trust and follow me. Even when you can't see it and you can't see it. See, sometimes we have to disconnect from our outward sensory realm, seeing and hearing, and so that we can connect with our insight realm that God has put on the inside of us. Because sometimes our outward sensory realm contradicts our insight of what God's Word has said to us and about us. And so when I'm really connected to my outward sensory, and it says, I don't see how that's going to work out. I don't know how this is going to be. I don't see no end to this, and I'm seeing this, and I'm, hear and I'm hearing the negative report. I'm hearing the negative issues come along. And I have to detach myself from that and un unplug from that because the Word of God says something totally different about me and my situation. Everything in this Word is put in there for you and I for the journeys that we will be making and in the, in the, in the situations that we will be involved in in our lives. So I have to disconnect, and when I disconnect, it enables the insight in me because if you don't, your outward sensory realm will override the insight that God wants to put in you, and your insight is faith. 
Your insight is taking a step of faith. Your insight is trusting and believing in God. And uh, even though you don't see it, even though the circumstances are not lining up just right, and, and you're not getting that favorable report, insight says, unplug from that, trust in me, don't lean to your understanding, but trust and acknowledge me in all of your ways, and I will lead and guide and direct you in the paths of truth. So, it's important, it's important that we go insight instead of sensory realm. The journey will be made at night. God never designed the Christian life to work in a beautiful environment only. I know this is maybe not real popular and, and many of you, you know, you want the feel good message, but I'm telling you, sometimes we got to have this kind of words. We got to have these kind of words that will sustain us through the tough times, through the dark times. Remember what I said in the beginning of this, you're not in darkness, you're going through it. That means there is a light coming. There is a light to the end of the tunnel. There is the goodness of God. It's the goodness of God that sustains you through the dark times, that brings you into the land of the living. Amen? Hallelujah. Give the Lord a clap of praise for that. God designed the Christian life that when we are going through the darkest hours of our life, our faith would come become the strongest. When we go through the darkest times and the issues of our lives, God is saying, I may not have authored that in your life. I didn't set that up for you to go through that, but since, it's, since it has came into your life, I'm going to capitalize on this. I'm going to do Romans 8.28. Because I make all things work together for the good of them that love me and are called to the Lord. And, I, and so as you go through this dark time, your faith is going to be exercised and become strong in me. Satan said to God one day, he said, hey, I'd like to test Job. We've all heard of Job. He said, but I can't get to Job because you've got him in a perfect environment you've got this hedge of protection around him and uh and he is contained in your protection but if you will put him in darkness god i guarantee you he will curse you god knowing job the way he did because they had fellowship they were in relationship god says i will allow it and he will not curse me we all know the story. Job lost everything. Lost his home, lost his wife, lost his children, lost his livestock, lost everything. He, and then, it, then the attacks came on his body. He got uh, boils and sores all over him. Uh, people came and his friends, his so-called friends. Anybody got any so-called friends? So-called friends, when he, when he was up high and flying mighty, they was around. But when, when all the de destruction and all the... Uh, the subtraction came in his life, and the dark time came in his life. You know what the friends did? They sit there and looked at him and said, Curse God. What are you going to do? How long are you going to go with this? His wife even turned on him and said, Curse God and die. He said, I can't do it because I know who sustains me. I know who has saved me. I, knew who, I know who gave me everything that I've got. And, and Job took it another step further. This is, how, this is how secure he was in his relationship with Jesus. He went this, he said, even though he may slay me, I will trust in him. <laughs> That's faith. Even though he may take me out, God wasn't. But this is where Job was. Even though it may not get better, even though I may not see the, the light at the end of the tunnel and he may slay me, I will trust the Lord. Folks, that's where we got to get. This is where we got to get in life. Total dependence and total trust in God. It's not an easy place to get to. It's not a fun place to get to. But we need to be moving in that direction. That we don't trust and rely on our own power and our own being and our own influence but we trust God in everything and we give everything to him life is not fair 
Anybody can I have an amen from the hallelujah pew? Life is not fair, but God is just. God's not fair. God's not a fair God. He's a just God. Life is not fair. His word is just. Can I, can I give you a Calvary news flash? Every promise and every command in this Bible is not automatic. Oh, pastor, you've really messed me up today. Every promise, every principle, every command, every good thing is not an automatic thing. Well, how do you say that, pastor? Because there's a variable. It's called us. And we have to position and place ourselves and get into the Word of God and, 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 and align our life with the Word of God so that when we get into a dark situation as we're going through, then we can apply the principles and the commands. Not just only in the dark times, but in the good times. We need to acknowledge Him in all of our ways, the Bible says. Everything will come into your life that needs to come into your life if you're lining yourself up. But it's not automatic. He put it in here for our good and our benefit. But he says, I want, I want a partnership. I want a, I want a communion with you. And, and so I need you to, to make the Word of God and, and, the, and the way of I do things a priority in your life. Sometimes all we have is our trust in the character of God. Sometimes all we have in a, in a situation in our life is the trust in the character of God. Maybe we're not sensing what God is doing in our lives. Maybe He still kind of got us hit. You know, God hides you sometimes from the very blunt of, of the darkness that you're going through, even though you think it may be about to overtake you and overcome you. He's got you sheltered. He's got you hid. And, and in your own mind, you think, how can it get any worse? But if he, if he pulled back, if he pulled back his protection and his covering from you, you would be consumed and you would be destroyed. There's sometimes God brings things to a stop and a halt in our life that we're not even aware of because he's protecting us. But he uses this time enough to bring about maturity and growth in our lives. The recipe for being miserable is to get in a corner and think about yourself and, and, see, and think about how bad it is. How woe is me. I, I said in the first service, this kind of come out. I said, he want, the Satan wants to get you in a corner and you to have a pity party and say, woe is me, woe is me to you. When you come out of the corner, you look like a pug. <laughs> he wants to drive your face into that corner and into that stuff till he, he has distorted you and your viewpoint of what the things of God are about. See, that's Satan's number one goal is to distort. Distort God's plan, to distort his viewpoint and your viewpoint of the goodness of the Lord. The Bible says that going up to someone and, and blasting them with a, with a hose of the gospel, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, you need to do this, you need to do that, you can't do this, you can't do that. God don't say nothing about it. He says, you, what, what is the goodness of God leads people to repentance. Not the fire hose of blasting them down with, you know, you need to get your life straightened up. You need to do this. You can't do that. No, he says it's the goodness of God that leads people to repentance. We need to live our lives in a way that people see the goodness. Man, what's different about you? What, what, I, I know you've went through a tough time. Diane and I have been, you all have been here when Diane and I have been through a tough time with our family. And I'll be very honest with you, very transparent. There's been times I've walked out of that room and walked across the front of here and went over there and sat, and I didn't want to preach because I was carrying a heavy load with my family and some of the issues and the circumstances that were going on in our family and with our children. Preaching was the last thing I wanted to do, and, and, and I preached through 
tears and I preached through hurt and I preached through pain and I, I know there are times I stumbled over my messages and I stumbled over words and, and everything, but, but I remained faithful to the calling and to the things of God and what I couldn't do in my own natural strength God came in and made up the difference He made the difference up He took my weakness and bore me up he took the things, my inadequacies that I allowed to get to me. And he says, hey, Jim, I've got this. Just take that step of faith. Come out of that office. Walk across this front. And I promise you, by the time you get there and you get up here, I will empower you and endue you with the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And he does it. So I said, that's, we've all got issues. We've all got dark times in our life. But the, pro, the thing is, we go through it. We go through it. We never allow it to overcome us and overtake us. The Apostle Paul said in Acts 26, 2, said, I think, this is going to sound silly to some of you, I think myself happy. <laughs> is it that easy? I think. Yeah, he said, when I get down and out, when I get destitute, when those thoughts, ideals, and suggestions all flood back into my mind of how I martyred the Christians before I had my Damascus Road experience, when that tries to overwhelm me and overwash me again, I think myself happy. How do you think yourself happy? First of all, you need an atmosphere change. Wherever you're at, change your atmosphere. If you've got to go into a different room, a different chair, a different location, whatever, and you begin to go out and thank God for the goodness. Begin to tell Him of all the goodness that you got. Pastor, I don't feel like i got anything good. Are you breathing? Are you, do you have income? Do you have a home? Do, do, I mean, you're not six foot under. Man, that right there puts you in the upper percentile of being blessed. So you think yourself happy. You can think yourself hopeless. You can let worry, fear, and anxiety wash over you. And, I, and, I, and we, all, we all deal with this. When I'm standing up here preaching this, we all deal with this. I, I'm trying to encourage you, okay? We can think ourselves hopeless. We can think ourselves sad. We can have the pity party and say, woe is me. Or you can change your atmosphere and think yourself happy. You get into the Bible and you begin to devour the Word of God until the Word becomes, now listen, this is a key point. If you don't get anything else that I say this morning, you get this. You begin to devour the Word of God until the Word becomes more real to you than the reality around you. It's the Word that sustains you, not the reality around you. The reality around you will contradict what this word says, but then there's when the faith comes in. I'm going through the darkness. I walk by faith and not by sight. I act like it's so, even though it's not so, so it can become so. In other words, I'm giving God something to work with. So when the word of God becomes greater in my life than the reality that says, this ain't going to happen, this ain't going to work out, you're not going to get a breakthrough, you're not going to get a reprieve, Whatever it might be, the reality of God's Word has to be the final authority in your life. And then you put your anchor, you anchor yourself in the Word of God. And say, I, de I disconnect from my sensory realm and I get into my insight realm. The insight of God's Word. Isn't that good? I love that. Hallelujah. Remember, others that have gone... Before you have gone through this, and they've gone through the darkness, and they've come out on the other side. When Abraham told I, uh, God, uh, when Abraham was told by God, "Take Isaac," you know Isaac, the one I promised you, the one that you thought that wasn't going to come, and you jumped the gun, and you got in the flesh, and you made Ishmael, and now that's why we got the problem we got today. But I promised you a seed. And I was going to bring that to pass. But here's what I want you to do, Abraham. I want you to take that promise and that seed. And I want you to go to yonder mountain. And I want you to sacrifice. Because sacrifice 
was big back in that day. So Abraham, being a, a man of God and a man of faith, he goes to yonder mountain, and him and his son Isaac climbed that mountain. It's a perfect picture of what Jesus Christ did in the New Testament. Isaac carried the wood up the hill for the sacrifice. Jesus Christ carried the cross to Golgotha's hill to be sacrificed. It's a perfect picture. It was a dark time for both. But they knew the will and the purpose of God, and they would not waver from doing what God had told them to do. God never explained to Abraham why he was to do that. Sometimes God may never explain to you and I why we're to do certain things, but we're to do them. We're to act by faith, not by the sensory realm, but by the insight of God's Word. Could it be that, getting back to the book of Job, could it be that the book of Job was written to show us that a promise is greater than an explanation? A promise is greater than an explanation? God, God promised Abraham, his son Isaac, was the promised seed. He didn't explain to him why he may have to sacrifice him. We know that God showed up and provided a sacrifice so Abraham didn't have to kill his son. But an explanation, a promise out of God's word is better than an explanation. Because if we have to live on explanations, that means we'll never take that step of faith, Phyllis, until somebody tells us A, B, C, D. And then when you get done that, go do E, F, G. But if you say, if you will do what I'm telling you to do, and, and I promise you that the end result will be good. There's a promise at the, at the end of your obedience, if you will. And it will be awesome. As a believer, I know you have or walked through darkness and felt like God had forsaken you. Nature tells us that there is a need for darkness in our lives. I know that don't sound very positive, but it is positive. Even nature tells us that there's a need for darkness. Nothing lives in unbroken sunlight. You think about this. If there was never darkness, only bright sunshine every day, 24-7, earth would be a desert because it's in that dark time at night that things get to recoup and to replenish. And in the dark time of night, God begins to let the dew come up from the ground and to be released into the grass and to the plants. And he, and he gives, it, gives it a break from the brutal daylight that exposes everything. You know, we had a storm a couple days ago, man, at my house. It came through, and I mean, it was pouring rain like you know what out of a boot okay I mean it it and we got some really nice hostas in our backyard by our deck really nice. I mean they're big I mean they're healthy people people come over and say man you got some of the best looking hosta I ever seen in my life but after that storm I walked back out on the deck and I looked down and man that hosta was beat to death I mean it was all laid over it was bent over it, I thought man it, it's destroyed it's destroyed that next morning when I got up, through the darkness, through the night, I went back out there. And I know this is a simple little illustration, but I got up and I went back out there and I looked and that hosta was right back up in its place. Those big old leaves all firm and standing to attention and all, they looked better than they did before the, the storm came. What happened? It was through the darkness and through the night that they began to get their strength back and they got back into right position because through the sunlight and through the day's activities they got beat down and beat out of place. Sometimes we get beat down and we get beat out of place but it's through the dark times, it's through the darkness of God, of walking in God's timing that we have that and he takes that and he says through this dark time I'm going to restore your soul. 
I'm going to renew your soul. I'm going to restore your spirit. I'm going to bind up your wounds, and I'm going to heal your broken heart. Those are those times that we, we feel the, the replenishing of God's presence. Even nature knows what to do. And us humanity, we get it wrong sometimes. But it's all laid out in here for us. I'm closing. I'm closing. I'm going to read Romans uh, in closing. I'm going to read. Uh, I'm going to read Romans eight, twenty-eight through thirty-nine. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, those he also called. Whom he called, he also justified. And whom he justified, he has also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? <laughs> if God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us in the dark time, who can be against us? The darkness will not overwhelm us or overtake us. He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. And who is at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us? So we got the promise that God is aware aware of our issues and of our circumstances that he's sitting at the right hand of God the Father saying, do you see what Jim Mullins is going through? Do you see what uh, Phyllis Heights is going through? Do you see what Linda's going through? Do you see what Dave Hudson's going through? Do you, Father, I'm going to make intercession for them because they're in a dark time. They're going through a dark time. And I promise you, as he pleads our case to God the Father, God the Father gets involved and makes things happen on our end for our good. Amen? It is written. Oh, let me go back. Who shall separate? I love this right here. I love this. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who's going to do that? Shall tribulation, darkness, distress, persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long and we are accounted as sheep led to the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, or powers, or things present, nor things to come, or darkness, or any situation that you're going through right now that might be a trial of your life, none of that. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, be it you created it or somebody else created it against you, shall be able to separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. 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 So what does that tell me, Pastor? It tells me, no matter what come, no matter what hell or high water may come in our life, no matter what issue, circumstance, or obstacle that comes in our life, no matter what trial, no matter, no matter what darkness, no matter if it's self-inflicted or I got caught, in sub, caught up in something and drug into something that I had nothing to do with, no matter what, there is nothing that can separate us from the love and the protection of God Almighty. Nothing. Amen. Stand with me. Hallelujah.